Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Firewalls Don't Stop Dragons. I'm your host, Kerry Parker. Today we have episode 301 for December 5th, 2022. So the countdown to 400 can officially begin. A few quick notes before we start. Uh, this will be the last official news show for the year due to the holidays. Uh, I've got two more interviews for you and then a best of 2022 episode, uh, which will come in between those two. And then we'll resume to regular schedule on January 2nd, at which point I will announce the winners for the big 300th episode slash fifth edition of the book giveaway that is going on now. You have until the end of the year, specifically until basically midnight on New Year's Eve to enter the contest. It has almost $2,000 worth of prizes that I'm giving away to a total of five different people. I actually just added uh, some prizes to this. I got a kind of a late submission from LastPass. So I've got some coupons for LastPass to add to the prize list. It's really quite a lot of stuff. So you can get all the details by going to fdsd.me slash ep300. Also, there's a big patron promotion going on for new and existing patrons if you sign up for an annual membership. And that also will be going on till the end of December. All right, two more things. Uh, Chrome has just released a big update for a zero-day flaw in its browser. You know, if you insist on still using Chrome, then definitely update that. Or, you know, once again, take this opportunity to use something different. I personally recommend Firefox with uBlock Origin, but you could also use the Brave browser. And also iOS just came out with a security update as well. They're being rather tight-lipped about what it fixes, giving people time to get that installed. So my guess is it's something important, so I would update your iOS devices as well. All right, we got a lot of news for you to cover today. We're going to talk about how the San Francisco Police Department wants to arm its robots the TSA is ramping up its use of facial recognition to verify people getting on flights. Brave has started using what they're calling privacy-preserving ads in their Brave search results. Microsoft warns us that hackers are using Google ads to deliver ransomware. A study done by some folks in Canada show that taking your devices in to have them repaired may open you up to some serious privacy invasions. WhatsApp has announced a data breach of over 500 million user records. Also, the Twitter data breach that we heard about was far worse than it was originally reported. Meta, the company that owns Facebook, has removed a bunch of fake accounts used by the United States to spread propaganda and misinformation. A new report from the uh, General Accounting Office here in the United States says that our oil and gas rigs are at significant risk of cyber attacks. Microsoft is warning about a new malware that is able to bypass Microsoft's security warnings for downloaded files. LastPass has a rather troubling update to its August data breach. And then finally, I'm going to talk about an article about uh, Anchor's Eufy security cameras and uh, doorbell cameras and how it's been found that it is actually giving up more information than they claimed they were doing. And that's going to dovetail nicely with a question from one of you guys who submitted a pseudo question to me as part of my Dear Carrie segment where I answer questions from you guys. So we'll wrap it up with that. And finally, for my tip of the week, it's the holiday season, which means that it is the season for scams, unfortunately. This is a big time of year for scammers to be active. So I thought it'd be a good time to go over some tips for avoiding scams. All right, lots to cover. Let's get to it. All right, first up, we have this notice from the Electronic Frontier Foundation who's calling the alarm about uh, a new initiative by the San Francisco Police Department, the SFPD. Let me just read this and I'll give you my take. The San Francisco Board of Supervisors will vote soon on a policy that would allow the San Francisco Police Department to use deadly force by arming its many robots. This is a spectacularly dangerous idea and EFF's stance is clear. Police should not arm robots. Police technology goes through mission creep, meaning equipment reserved only for specific or extreme circumstances ends up being used in increasingly everyday or casual ways. We've already seen this with military-grade predator drones flying over protests and police buzzing by the window of an activist home with drones. As the policy is currently written, the robot's use will be governed by this passage. And this is a quote from their policy. Quote, the robots listed in this section shall not be utilized outside of training and simulations, criminal apprehensions, critical incidents, exigent circumstances, executing a warrant, or during suspicious device assessments. 
Robots will only be used as a deadly force option when risk of loss of life to members of the public or officers is imminent and outweighs any other force option available to SFPD, unquote. This is incredibly broad language. Police could bring armed robots to every arrest and every execution of a warrant to search a house or vehicle or device. Depending on how police choose to define the words critical or exigent, police might even bring armed robots to a protest. While police could only use armed robots as deadly force when the risk of death is imminent, this problematic legal standard has often been under-enforced by courts and criticized by activists. Okay, so <laughs> it's a short article, uh, and I really brought it up mostly as an example of what's to come. This is, this is not going to be the first time that law enforcement agencies are going to be wanting to do this sort of thing. And I look, I get it. They don't want to put their officers in harm's way. So they would rather send in a robot. And by the way, if you're wondering what sorts of robots we're talking about here, these are usually little things on wheels. Like these are often used to check out suspicious packages to see if they contain explosives. But they've also got these funky new things from a company called Boston Dynamics and some other companies that are basically ripping off Boston Dynamics that kind of look like headless dogs. They're four-legged robots that are battery operated, remotely operated, and can do some pretty amazing, like creepily amazing things. Uh, I'll, I'll see if I can't find a link and put one in the show notes so you can see what I'm talking about. But it was just a matter of time before someone said, hey, why don't we put a gun on that thing? <laughs> or in this case, it's actually explosives. They're saying, oh, no, don't worry. It's, we're not putting guns on these robots, just explosives. But this is obviously a troubling trend, and that's something that we need to be thinking about. We're, we've been using drones a lot already, mostly for surveillance, but obviously in military and counterterrorism, we've been using it to kill people already. So they're already controversial in that sense. But it's just a matter of time before we start trying to do the same things locally with law enforcement. So we need to be thinking very carefully about what we want to allow robots to do. And I think I am firmly in the camp that we should not allow law enforcement robots to have lethal force. But these are debates that we need to have. So I really am bringing this up so you could be thinking about it because this is getting real and it may be coming to your town at some point. The other thing to keep in mind is even if we trust the you know, the respective law enforcement agencies to do the right thing with these devices and only use them in the most dire of circumstances when there is no other option. These things are remotely controlled. These things run software. Software has bugs. These things can and will be hacked. Also, people that work for these law enforcement agencies are human. They are flawed. They can go rogue. They can make mistakes. So we're not going to be able to prevent criminals and terrorists and other ne'er-do-wells from using remote technology and robots to do nefarious things. But we can decide as a society what we want to allow our law enforcement agencies to be able to do with these technologies. All right, moving on. This is from the Washington Post. It's about facial recognition technology expanding its use in our airports. Next time you're at airport security, get ready to look straight into a camera. The TSA wants to analyze your face. The Transportation Security Administration has been quietly testing controversial facial recognition technology for passenger screening at 16 major domestic airports. And by the way, I looked into this and I couldn't find a solid list. In fact, I found some other list that said it might be as many as 32 airports. But the ones that they mention here are Washington and L.A., but I think they're using it at Atlanta as well. I think a lot of them are focused on airports that have international that have a lot of international flights. Uh, anyway, back to the article and hopes to expand it across the United States as soon as next year. Kiosks with cameras are doing a job that used to be completed by humans, checking the photos of travelers IDs to make sure they're not imposters. The TSA says facial recognition, which has been banned by cities such as San Francisco, helps improve security and possibly also efficiency. But it's also bringing in unproven tech with civil rights ramifications we still just don't understand to one of the most stressful parts of travel. After hearing concerns from the Washington Post readers who encountered face scans while traveling, I wanted to know how the TSA is using the tech and what our rights are. Everybody wants better safety, but is this really safer? And what are its real costs? So I quizzed the TSA's Jason Lim, who helps run the program formerly known as Credential Authentication Technology with Camera, or CAT2, and I also called Albert Fox Kahn, the founder of the Surveillance Technology Oversight Project, or STOP, and one of the biggest critics of facial recognition. 
I learned that the TSA has put some important constraints on its use of facial recognition, but its current programs are just the beginning. No, you don't have to participate in facial recognition at the airport. Whether you feel like it's a real choice is a separate question. When some people hear about governments using facial recognition, they rightly picture the situation in China, where broad use of the technology makes it extremely difficult for citizens to evade surveillance. Does going through airport security now mean Homeland Security has a face ID that can identify you at a protest? The TSA says it doesn't use facial recognition for law enforcement purposes. It also says it minimizes holding on to your face data, so it isn't using scans to build out a new national database of face IDs. And this is a quote from Lim. Uh, Lim says, quote, The scanning and match is made and immediately overwritten at the travel document checker podium. We keep neither the live photo nor the photo of the ID, unquote. But the TSA did acknowledge that there are cases in which it holds on to the data for up to 24 months so its science and technology office can evaluate the system's effectiveness. This is kind of like, you know, this call may be recorded for quality assurance kind of stuff. What's more, the TSA already has a plan to expand the scope of how it's using the tech. It's running a pilot of a second system at a few airports where you don't even have to present your physical ID for inspection. Your face is your ID. In tests with Delta, machines compare passengers' live faces to a database of photos the government already has, typically from passports. For now, the system only works for passengers with pre-check or global entry, and passengers also have to request it from Delta. A colleague recently tried it in Atlanta and reported it was like an extra fast version of PreCheck that probably saved him five minutes on his trip. Just remember, anytime data gets collected somewhere, it could also be stolen, and you only get one face. The TSA says all its databases are encrypted to reduce hacking risk, but in 2019, the Department of Homeland Security disclosed that photos of travelers were taken in a data breach accessed through the network of one of its subcontractors. So, do you have to participate? And this is a quote from Lim again, quote, none of this facial recognition technology is mandated. Those who do not feel comfortable will still have to present their ID, but they can tell the officer that they do not want their photo taken and the officer will turn off the live camera, unquote. There are also supposed to be signs around informing you of your rights, but does it mean that you'll get moved to a slow line, get an extra pat down or a mark on your record? Again, a quote from Lim, quote, you should have no derogatory experience based on you exercising your right, unquote. If you suspect that that has happened, the TSA says you should ask to speak to a manager. And this is now a quote from Khan, the, uh, the person from Stop, quote, what we often see with these biometric programs is that they are only optional in the introductory phases. And over time, we will see them becoming standardized and nationalized and, event and eventually compulsory. There is no place more coercive to ask people for their consent than an airport, unquote. Even people who care a lot about privacy often find their limits when it comes to airline travel. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. People gravitate to options that help them get through the airport faster. And it's not hard to imagine ending up with a bifurcated airport experience, says Khan. Those who have the privilege of not having to worry their face will be misread can zip right through whereas people who don't consent to it pay a tax with their time. At that point, how voluntary is it, really? So I completely agree with, with most of the sentiments listed here, and, and I think calling these things optional is misleading at best, just as this article says. First of all, you're already in this weird authority scenario where the person standing in front of you can kick you out of the airport, can let, not let you get on your flight, can hassle you in some way. Uh, and so, you know, you're, you're, you're disinclined to ruffle any feathers at this point. So walking up and saying, Hey, could you turn that camera off? Even if you do it in a nice way, it's just going to make a lot of people feel really uncomfortable to the point where they probably won't do it. And then also if, if your choice is, well, you can get through really quickly and be on your way and get to your gate and not miss your flight, or you can kind of make a scene and stand out in front of the crowd and take this really slow lane over here for all the weird people. So, you know, it's one thing to say you have a choice, but there's a lot of reasons why that is not really true, why it's not just a simple yes or no option for most people. I understand the efficiencies here, but facial recognition technology can get really creepy really fast. It's a very slippery slope. It can, it can be abused. And as this article says, when you start talking about biometric information, it's not like a password where if, if that gets out and someone hacks your password, then, well, you know, I can change my password. You can't change your face. You can't change your fingerprints. You can't change your iris pattern. If that data is kept somewhere 
it can be stolen, it can be abused, and that you can't change it. There's nothing you can do to fix that. So I think we really, really need to think very carefully about using biometrics for, unfortunately for anything. I understand the convenience factor, but it's got really high risks. All right, here's a quick article from Bleeping Computer about uh, Brave. Brave Software announced that as part of a global beta program, it is now displaying, quote unquote, privacy preserving ads in between results shown by its web search engine to select users. All private search ads, as Brave calls them, shown by Brave Search throughout this beta test will be clearly marked according to the company and will not be linked to their identity. And this is a quote from Brave, quote, by design, Brave Search ads are anonymous, clearly marked, and follow Brave's commitment to putting users first and to ethical and transparent advertising practices, unquote. Brave added that its search engine would only use the user's search query, country, and device type to deliver the ads and would not create advertising profiles on their searches to push personalized ads. The company also offers Search Premium, which provides premium access to Brave Search, allowing those willing to pay $3 a month to enjoy an ad-free experience while searching the web. This helps users, quote, directly support Brave's mission to make the web a more private place with independent search, unquote. So that's the article. So a couple of quick takes on this. First of all, DuckDuckGo already does this. They already use whatever you type into the search engine and you know, presumably probably your location in terms of like what country you're in, you know, to make sure that, you know, any ads they show you would be, you know, in the right language and have make sense for your location. So I, I don't think that's a stretch to, you know, to use the country of origin of the search to decide what ads to show, but it's all contextual. So whatever, if I go to DuckDuckGo or now Brave and search on, you know, best running shoes, it would make sense that right there in the search results, they would offer, hey, if you're looking for shoes, click these new Nike things. Oh, and here's a coupon. But it has nothing to do with you. It's not tracking you. If you come back and search for something else later, you're not going to then again see the Nike ad. You'll see something related to whatever you just searched on. And, you know, and as I always say, ads themselves aren't inherently bad. I mean, we've decided that we have an, a business model for the Internet where people like stuff that's quote unquote free. And so, you know, these companies that have to monetize somehow, I mean, these services they're offering do cost money. They got to make money somewhere. And so they turn to advertising. This is the bargain that we have currently struck for the quote unquote free internet. So ads themselves are not, again, inherently bad, though I've got an article next, which will help explain why I still think that we should be using ad blockers. But it's really the tracking that's the problem. That's, that's what we really have to be looking out for here. And Brave is not doing any tracking, at least according to this. But, but that leads to this next story. So this is from tech.co, which I've never heard of before, but I ran across this article and it's, uh, it's a warning from Microsoft about malvertising. In a recent report, Microsoft has warned of a ransomware group that is spreading malicious files through Google ads in conjunction with more traditional methods such as phishing emails. The threat actor uses these adverts to point the victim to download links, which appear to be legitimate files, but instead are harboring harmful software. Microsoft research has shown that a threat actor, dubbed as DEV0569 by the company, has been inserting dangerous malware into Google ads in an attempt to trick users into downloading malicious files, believing them to be genuine software. Between August and October of 2022, Microsoft researchers observed activity where links in Google ads, as well as phishing emails and blog posts, directed users to software downloads such as Adobe, TeamViewer, Zoom, and others. Instead of the legitimate software, users would download ransomware, which would then attack the user's systems. Microsoft has confirmed that all identified instances of Google ads being used as a distribution system have been reported to Google. Using adverts to infiltrate systems in this way, known as malvertising, may be new to many users who are likely much more familiar with more traditional practices such as phishing emails. So this article, by the way, goes on to have lots of suggestions for what company IT departments could do to mitigate these risks. So it sounds like this, I've, again, I've never heard of tech.co, but it sounds like it's kind of geared toward enterprise and maybe enterprise uh, IT departments. But most of the things they recommended were not particularly relevant to, you know, average consumers. So I didn't include them here. However, I did notice that they didn't say anything about using ad blockers. And so I, you know, I would suppose Microsoft probably wouldn't suggest that since they do have their own ad business, but man, it really seems like that's something that <laughs> something that, you know, you should at least consider doing, but this does underscore why I still feel perfectly justified in saying and recommending to people as I do that you use an ad blocker. 
I do understand the, the financial aspects of this. I just talked about those. Uh, but I certainly believe you, you are within your rights to block ads if you wish to do so. And I think you've got a legitimate reason to do so. I mean, there are cases where ads can be laced with JavaScript that actually does direct harm, or they can trick you into clicking on phishing sites or into downloading uh, infected documents or software. So I think we are all certainly within our rights to not look at ads if we don't want to. However, on the flip side of that is, I also understand that a website may not want to show you their contents if they detect that you are blocking their ads. That is the trade-off. That's what we're looking at here. But what I really, really wish we could do is find some other business model for the internet instead of advertising. There's been all sorts of talk over the years about you know, using micro payments of some sort, you know, throw in blockchain there. Cause you know, why not brave attention tokens? You know, it's an interesting idea, but we've got to figure something out. I, but you know, obviously one solution is just, just to pay, but paying a subscription for every single site you go to can just be painful. We need to really kind of come up with some other sort of micro payment system, or uh, I don't know, we need, we need a better model. I suppose if I had an idea that I could just rattle off, I'd be a billionaire, but I hope we can come up with something because this whole ad based thing is just causing all sorts of problems. All right, next up, this is a rather disturbing article from Ars Technica. Uh, but I do have a couple interesting takes on this that uh, I think this is interesting. But it, uh, anyway, let me read the article and then and then I'll talk about it. It's a little bit long. So bear with me. I've actually cut out quite a bit here. But uh, here's the important stuff. If you've ever worried about the privacy of your sensitive data when seeking a computer or phone repair, a new study suggests you have good reason. It found that privacy violations occurred at least 50% of the time, not surprisingly with female customers bearing the brunt. Now, don't get overly excited about the stats here, which I'll talk about in a minute. But let me, let me finish the article, then I'll get into that. Researchers at the University of Guelph, and that's spelled G-U-E-L-P-H, I'm not familiar with that, in Ontario, Canada, recovered logs from laptops after receiving overnight repairs from 12 commercial shops. The logs show that technicians from six of the locations had accessed personal data and that two of those shops also copied data onto a personal device. Devices belonging to females were more likely to be snooped on, and that snooping tended to seek more sensitive data, including both sexually revealing and non-sexual pictures, documents, and financial information. The amount of snooping may actually have been higher than recorded in the study, which was conducted from October to December 2021. In all, the researchers took the laptops to 16 shops in the greater Ontario region. Logs on devices from two of those visits weren't recoverable. Two of the repairs were performed on the spot and in the customer's presence, so the technician had no opportunity to surreptitiously view personal data. In three cases, Windows Quick Access or Recently Accessed Files had been deleted in what the researchers suspect was an attempt by the snooping technician to cover their tracks. As noted earlier, two of the visits resulted in the logs the researchers relied on being unrecoverable. In one, the researcher explained that they had installed antivirus software and performed a disk cleanup to, quote, remove multiple viruses on the device, unquote. The researchers received no explanation in the other case. The laptops were freshly imaged Windows 10 laptops. All were free of malware and other defects and in perfect working condition with one exception. The audio driver was disabled. The researchers chose that glitch because it required only a simple and inexpensive repair, was easy to create, and didn't require access to users' personal files. Half of the laptops were configured to appear as if they belonged to a male and the other half to a female. All the laptops were set up with email and gaming accounts and populated with browser history across several weeks. The researchers added documents, both sexually revealing and non-sexual pictures, and a cryptocurrency wallet with credentials. The researchers also configured the laptops to run a custom logging app that used the Windows Steps Recorder utility in the background. The utility captured the screen on every mouse click and recorded every key pressed by the user. The researchers also enabled Windows Audit Policy to log access to any file on the device. The researchers then brought the laptops to two national outlets, two regional ones, and four local ones. Half the customers were male and the other half were female. Besides finding widespread snooping, the study uncovered other problems. Among them, the vast majority of repair shops provide no privacy policy and those that do have no means of enforcing them. Even worse, repair technicians required a customer to surrender their login password even when it wasn't necessary for the repair needed. 
These findings came from a separate part of the study in which the researchers brought an Asus laptop into 11 shops for a battery replacement. This repair doesn't require a technician to log into the machine since the removal of the back of the device and access to the device BIOS for checking the battery health is all that's needed. Despite this, all but one of the repair service providers asked for the credentials to the device OS anyway. When the customer asked if they could get the repair without providing the password, three refused to take the device without it, four agreed to take it but warned they wouldn't be able to verify their work or be responsible for it, one asked the customer to remove the password, and one said they would reset the device if it was required. In all, the findings from the study were, and then it lists these five things. First, privacy policies and the practice of communicating protocols and controls to protect customers' data do not exist across service providers of all sizes. Two, service providers largely require all access to the device, even when it's unnecessary. Three, technicians often snoop on customers' data and sometimes copy those to external devices. Four, technicians who violate privacy often do so carefully to not generate evidence or remove such evidence. Five, a significant portion of broken devices are not repaired due to privacy concerns. For the devices that get repaired, device owners are concerned about threats to their privacy but do not use the proper controls to protect their data. That sounds like it was from a different study because the statistics they gave on that one were very different from the others. So anyway, first of all, speaking of statistics, the this was a very small study. They went to 12 places in Ontario. This article actually had several bits of statistics in here, but I kind of skipped over a lot of them because I, I, I don't think you could extrapolate <laughs> in any meaningful way to all service repair shops based on what these guys found. However, what it does show is there are real problems in the computer repair industry that you need to be aware of. And if you're taking your device into the Geek Squad or your local repair shop or even sending it away to, you know, Apple or Dell or, you know, wherever, if you're, you know, even big companies, right? Uh, there are risks. There are concerns. You've got a lot of data on that computer. And in a lot of cases for them to do what they need to do, they need some level of access to the software and the operating system on that device. This applies to smartphones and tablets as well. So I think it's really interesting that they did this study. And now that I've seen this, I would like to see more and broader studies done on this. But what I really want to see, and I think what this really needs to do is light a fire under these device manufacturers to provide secure and private mechanisms for their devices that they make and manufacture and control to be repaired by human beings while still somehow protecting the user's data. It's like we need a certain type of administrator account available, which hopefully the user would have the option to create and not be there by default, that would allow technicians to do some level of software-based diagnostic and repair work while still preserving the uh, integrity and the privacy of the personal data on that device. From a hardware perspective, I think there's a lot of things we could do that would allow uh, manufacturers to run a series of tests, but would also not give them direct access to user data. I know that some companies do some of these things already. I think Apple already has some of these things built in. However, I think this highlights the need for a much more broad adoption of these sorts of technologies and types of policies. And I mean, certainly these repair shops need privacy policies and you know they, they need to have something in writing that, that, that they can be held accountable to in case they do things they shouldn't be doing. So in the meantime, though, if you've got a device that's having a problem, be very aware that when you take it in for repair or send it away for repair uh, or even diagnostics, that the data on that device is at risk of being seen and potentially even copied. So no, that's not much consolation if you need to get your device fixed, but I suppose what that could mean is that you should certainly have your hard drive encrypted you might want to create a special account with non-administrator privileges, if possible, uh, for the technician to use. And worst case, you might want to, unfortunately, either copy off sensitive data while your device is being repaired and then put it back when you're done or just delete it. All right, let's move on. This is from uh, Tech Radar, and it's about a WhatsApp data breach. A post on a well-known hacking community forum claims almost half a billion WhatsApp records have been breached and are up for sale. The post, which multiple sources have confirmed is likely to be true, claims to be selling an up-to-date 
2022 database of 487 million mobile numbers used on WhatsApp, which contains data from 84 countries. This means that almost one quarter of all WhatsApp's estimated 2 billion monthly active users are possibly at risk. More than 32 million of the leaked records are said to be from users in the U.S., with 11 million from U.K. users. Other affected nations include Egypt with 45 million, Italy with 35 million, Saudi Arabia with 29 million, France with 20 million, Turkey with 20 million, and Russia with 10 million. It seems that individual countries' data is up for grabs, with the U.S. data set up for $7,000 and British numbers up for a similar per capita figure of $2,500. Most alarmingly, it doesn't seem to be an empty promise designed to threaten the meta-owned company, with almost 2,000 numbers shared with CyberNews in a sample request verified to be WhatsApp users. Leaked phone numbers could be used for any number of reasons, including marketing and phishing. So anyway, that was a short article, but you know, basically the takeaway here is if you're a WhatsApp user, be on the lookout for an email from Meta, the, the, the parent company who also owns Facebook. If your information has been compromised, hopefully they will let you know and give you some actions you might be able to take. But in the end, it sounds like they're really just getting phone numbers and potentially mapping that to uh, your identity. So the other thing to be on the lookout for is phishing scams that might be using that info. All right, next up, this is from 9to5Mac, and this is about the Twitter breach, which apparently was a lot worse than was originally reported. A massive Twitter data breach last year exposing more than 5 million phone numbers and email addresses was worse than initially reported. We've been shown evidence that the same security vulnerability was exploited by multiple bad actors, and the hacked data has been offered for sale on the dark web by several sources. It had previously been thought that only one hacker gained access to the data, and Twitter's belated admission reinforced this impression. HackerOne first reported the vulnerability back in January, which allowed anyone to enter a phone number or email address and then find the associated Twitter ID. This is an internal identifier used by Twitter, but can readily be converted to a Twitter handle. A bad actor would be able to put together a single database which contained Twitter handles, email addresses, and phone numbers. At the time, Twitter admitted that the vulnerability had existed and subsequently had been patched, but said nothing about anyone exploiting it. Restore Privacy subsequently reported that a hacker had indeed used the vulnerability to obtain personal data from millions of accounts. There were suggestions on Twitter yesterday, and this would have been last week for you, that the same personal data had been accessed by multiple bad actors, not just one. 9to5Mac has now seen evidence that this is indeed the case. We were shown a data set which contained the same information in a different format, with a security researcher stating that it was, quote, definitely a different threat actor, unquote. The source told us that this was just one of a number of the files they have seen. The data includes Twitter users in the UK, almost every EU country, and parts of the US. Any Twitter account which had the discoverability phone option enabled in late 2021 was listed in the dataset. The option referred to here is a setting which is pretty deeply hitting within Twitter's settings and which appears to be on by default. And there's a link to this in the article if you want to check that out. Bad actors are believed to have been able to download around 500,000 records per hour, and the data has been offered for sale by multiple sources on the dark web for around $5,000. Another security specialist who yesterday tweeted about the issue had their Twitter account suspended the same day. Internationally recognized computer security expert Chad Loader predicted Twitter's reaction and was confirmed right within minutes. And this is, I think, from Chad. They told me that multiple actors obtained the same data and combined it with data sourced from other breaches. There appear to have been multiple threat actors operating independently, harvesting this data throughout 2021 for both phone numbers and emails. The email Twitter pairings were derived by running existing large databases of 100 million plus email addresses through this Twitter discoverability vulnerability. We would reach out to Twitter for comment, but Musk fired the entire media relations team. So dot, dot, dot. So obviously this data breach, you know, is not good. The information breached was, you know, phone numbers and email addresses and Twitter handles. Uh, that doesn't mean that they can get into your accounts, but you know, they could use it for phishing. They could use it for marketing. They could use it for, you know, other purposes like that, but it's, you know, it's not like passwords or credit card numbers or anything like that. But the main reason I read this article is, you know, there's been a lot of news lately and a lot of focus on Twitter, you know, reinstating accounts of people spouting hate speech or mis or disinformation. That is, of course, bad. Elon Musk is doing some really crazy things over at Twitter and, you know, the company as a whole is in trouble. A lot of advertisers are walking away and that's how they make their money, you know. So if they don't have money, they're going to start getting more and more desperate. I, I don't know what's going on there, but 
what I haven't seen a whole lot of people talking about and something that I'm more worried about. And the reason I read this article is that loss of that many people and that much chaos within the company is going to make Twitter vulnerable. And it's probably just a matter of time before something much worse than this happens. The bad guys out there are surely sensing weakness. They're smelling blood in the water and they are going to be all over Twitter. And Twitter right now is seriously shorthanded. So strap in everybody. I think it's probably going to get worse. All right, next up, this is from Bleeping Computer. Meta has removed several accounts on Facebook and Instagram associated with the U.S. military, saying they were used as part of covert influence operations targeting the Middle East and Russia. Meta says it removed 39 Facebook accounts, 26 Instagram accounts, 16 Facebook pages, and two Facebook groups for violating its coordinated inauthentic behavior policy. The most successful of these Facebook pages had 22,000 followers. The more extensive group counted 400 members, while one of the banned Instagram accounts had 12,000 followers. And this is a quote from Meta's announcement. It says, quote, The U.S. network, linked to individuals associated with the U.S. military, operated across many internet services and focused on Afghanistan, Algeria, Iran, Iraq, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Russia, Somalia, Syria, Tajikistan, Uzbekistan, and Yemen, unquote. Meta found the inauthentic accounts after an internal investigation was launched following information by independent researchers at Graphica and the Stanford Internet Observatory, who published a five-year overview of pro-Western covert influence operations in August of 2022. The disinformation network operated in clusters that promoted specific topics corresponding to audience interest from the mentioned countries. The posters pretended to be locals in those countries, using fake photos generated by GAN, or Generative Adversarial Network Tools, to evade exposure by reverse image searches. In other words, they came up with fake faces. And that's a thing. And you, actually, you could do that yourself, by the way. Just go to the website thispersondoesnotexist.com to see what I mean. Notably, some of the banned pages used their own unique logos and visual style and linked to matching accounts on YouTube, Twitter. Uh, I don't know this one. Vacontact? I've never heard of this one. V-K-O-N-T-A-K-T-E. And dedicated websites. This is a quote from Meta. Quote, they posted videos, articles, photos, and memes about the country they focused on. When these brands ran the same image or meme, they would each superimpose its own logo on it, likely to make the content appear more unique and credible, unquote. A giveaway that these were fake accounts was that they were posted during U.S. business hours and not in the time zones of the countries they were supposedly based in. The people behind these clusters posted in Arabic, Farsi, and Russian to praise the U.S. military and raise terrorism concerns in regions of particular interest. The fake accounts used $2,500 in advertising on Facebook to ensure their disinformation content would reach more users. In many cases, the campaigns criticized Iran, China, and Russia, focusing on the Russian invasion of Ukraine, China's oppression of the Uyghur people, and the two countries' support of the Taliban regime in Afghanistan and Iran's influence in the Middle East. Previously, in September 2022, Facebook removed disinformation networks from China and Russia, with the latter using a staggering 1,633 fake accounts and 703 pages. So I read that article. I'm not going to say a whole lot on that other than, you know what, you know, we do it too. And I think Meta was perfectly in the right to treat, you know, U.S. misinformation and disinformation campaigns just like they would treat any other. All right, let's move on. This is from TechCrunch. The Government Accountability Office, or the GAO, said in a new report that the network of over 1,600 offshore facilities that produces a significant portion of U.S. domestic oil and gas are at growing risk of cyber attacks. The warning comes more than a year after ransomware attacks targeted Colonial Pipeline, bringing the U.S. oil pipeline system relied upon by millions of Americans to a standstill. The watchdog warned that not only has the government identified the offshore oil and gas sector as a target of malicious state actors, particularly those backed by China, Iran, North Korea, and Russia, but said operational technology, or OT, often used by these facilities to monitor and control physical equipment, contains multiple security flaws that could allow attackers to remotely take control of various functions, including those critical to safety. 
U.S. cybersecurity agency CISA has released several advisories about OT vulnerabilities this year alone, detailing issues like weak encryption and insecure firmware updates, and urged impacted users to identify baseline mitigations for reducing potential risks. The GAO noted in its new report that legacy OT infrastructure still in use at many facilities is also vulnerable due to the lack of both built-in cybersecurity measures and software security patches. The report notes that older devices, quote, do not have the capability to log commands sent to the devices, making it more difficult to detect malicious activity, unquote. The U.S. watchdog is calling on the Department of the Interior's Bureau of Safety and Environmental Enforcement, or BSWE, which oversees offshore oil and gas operations to address these growing security risks. It says that the agency had initiated efforts to address these cybersecurity risks as far back as 2015, but has yet to take any substantial action almost a decade later. The GAO notes that the BSWE started another such initiative earlier this year and hired a cybersecurity specialist to lead it, but the agency later said the effort was put on hold until the specialist is, quote, adequately versed in the relevant issues, unquote. And this is another quote from the GAO, quote, Absent the immediate development and implementation of an appropriate strategy, offshore oil and gas infrastructure will continue to remain at significant risk, unquote. And the GAO also noted that a successful attack on offshore oil and gas infrastructure could have catastrophic consequences, including, quote, deaths and injuries, damaged or destroyed equipment, and pollution to the marine environment, unquote. The U.S. watchdog is urging the BSWE to urgently develop and implement a cybersecurity strategy that includes risk assessments, objectives, activities, and performance measures, roles, responsibilities, and coordination, and the identification of required resources and investments. The BSWE, quote-unquote, generally concurred with the report and its recommendations. TechCrunch contacted BSWE for comment, but did not hear back. So this actually neatly ties together both last week's interview and next week's interview, because Bruce Schneier wrote a book called Click Here to Kill Everybody, which talks a lot about these vulnerabilities. And my guest next week, Josh Corman, was actually part of CISA and was behind similar efforts to protect these sorts of organizations and companies who have some severe security problems. And so we'll talk with Josh about that next week in a very, very interesting interview. All right, next up, here's a short one from Tech Radar. And this is about some new malware that is bypassing some of Microsoft's security warnings. Researchers have recently discovered a zero-day vulnerability that allows threat actors to run malware on target Windows endpoints without the victim devices raising any kind of alarms. The vulnerability, which is still reportedly yet to be patched, allows threat actors to bypass the so-called Mark of the Web, a Windows feature that labels files downloaded from untrusted internet locations. The malware being distributed is QBot, aka QuakeBot, an old and well-known banking trojan, but one that still poses a major threat to victims. The distribution starts with a phishing email, which contains a link to a password-protected zip archive. That, in turn, carries a disk image file, either a .img or a .iso file, which, if mounted, brings up a standalone JavaScript file with malformed signatures, a text file, and a folder with a .dll file. The JavaScript file carries a VB, or Virtual Basic script, that reads the contents of the text file, which triggers the execution of the DLL file. As Windows did not label ISO images with Mark of the Web flags properly, they were allowed to launch without any warnings. In fact, on devices running Windows 10 or newer, simply double-clicking on a disk image automatically mounts the file as a new drive letter. Microsoft has apparently been well aware of the flaw since at least October of 2022, but has yet to release a patch. But given that it's now been observed as being used in the wild, it's safe to assume we'll see a fix as part of the upcoming December Patch Tuesday update. All right. So anyway, a couple of quick takes on this. So first of all, I haven't really talked about the mark of the web much, but I think it's really interesting. It's obviously a good security feature. Basically, it's the operating system flagging these files with a little bit of metadata, you know, data about the data uh, on these files saying, hey, this this came from someplace that you might not want to trust. Maybe it was an email attachment. Maybe it was downloaded off the Internet. But this is something that came from somewhere else that we don't necessarily trust. So you might want to treat this file differently. And what this hacker or group of hackers or whatever has figured out is a way around that, a, a bug, a, a loophole in Microsoft's strategy for putting this mark of the web on a file, because apparently it doesn't do this with ISO images, with these disk images. 
And I also wanted to kind of point out with, with that torturous string of events that this is often how hackers do their thing. They take these simple, seemingly innocuous steps and they chain them together in such a way that it gets around uh, some protection. So anyway, I just thought that was interesting for those reasons. All right, so I've got two more articles now, both of which are kind of disturbing, uh, not the least of which because I have recommended both of these products. So in all fairness, I just want to make sure that I'm calling these things out when they happen. So this one's about LastPass. Back in August of 2022, popular password manager company LastPass admitted to a data breach. The company, which is owned by a software as a service business, GoTo, which used to be LogMeIn, published a very brief but nevertheless useful report about this incident about a month later, and we talked about that at the time. But briefly put, LastPass concluded that the attackers managed to implant malware on a developer's computer. With a beachhead on that computer, it seems that the attackers were then able to wait until the developer had gone through LastPass's authentication process, including presenting any necessary multi-factor authentication credentials, and then quote-unquote tailgate them into the company's development systems. LastPass insisted that the developer's account hadn't given the criminals access to any customer data or indeed to anyone's encrypted password vaults. The company did admit, however, that the crooks had made off with LastPass proprietary information, notably including, quote, some of our source code and technical information, unquote, and that the crooks were in the network for four days before they were spotted and kicked out. Right at the end of November 2022, however, LastPass further admitted that there was a bit more to the story than perhaps they'd hoped. According to a security bulletin dated November 30th, the company was recently breached again by attackers, quote, using information obtained in the August 2022 incident, unquote, and this time customer data was stolen. In other words, even if the criminals weren't able to dig around in customer records directly from the account of the developer who got infected by the malware attack in August, it seems that the crooks nevertheless made off with internal details that indirectly gave them or someone to whom they sold the data access to customer information later on. Unfortunately, LastPass isn't yet giving out any information about what sort of customer data was stolen, reporting simply that it is, quote, working diligently to understand the scope of the incident and identify what specific information has been accessed, unquote. All that LastPass can say for sure right now, and this was uh, as of December 1st, is to reiterate that, quote, our customers' passwords remain safely encrypted due to LastPass's zero-knowledge architecture, unquote. Zero knowledge is a jargon term that reflects the fact that although LastPass holds some sort of data in its customers' password vaults, it has no knowledge of what that data actually refers to, or even if it actually consists of account names and passwords at all. In short, even if it ultimately turns out that the crooks could have made off with personal information, such as home addresses, phone numbers, and payment card details, though we hope that's not the case, of course, your passwords are still as safe as the master password you originally chose for yourself, which LastPass's cloud services never ask for, let alone keep copies of. If you're a LastPass customer, we suggest you keep an eye on the company's security incident report for updates. So I've got a few things I need to say about this. First of all, as LastPass says, and as this article says, your LastPass data, whether it's passwords or secret notes or whatever you decide to put in your vault, is encrypted locally on your device, either on your phone or on your computer. It never leaves your device unencrypted. It is encrypted with your master password. LastPass does not know this password. Therefore, LastPass cannot look into your encrypted vault. Unless, of course, you picked a really crappy master password, which can be guessed. Also, this is really, I guess, maybe technically not a new breach. This is kind of an extension of the original August breach. It does seem like personal information may have gotten loose here. They don't know what yet. Uh, my guess is that once they figure out what information may have been taken, they will then notify people whose data was taken. It sounds like it would just be kind of general, general things like your name and email address, hopefully not credit card information. That's usually kept pretty secure, but we don't know yet. I also want to say that, you know, this can really happen to anybody. LastPass is a prime target often because it's popular. It's a well-known company. You know, the bad guys are going to go where the most information is. And so it's not surprising that LastPass was a target. I don't, you know, I haven't seen any evidence so far that tells me that LastPass was being negligent or that their product was insecure. So far, they have appeared to have been open and honest about what's going on. That's a good sign. They've always done so in the past. A lot of companies would sit on this until they had more information. LastPass is being more forward. I think that's a good thing. 
so while this is obviously not good news, you never want to see things like this. This can happen, I think, to anybody. And I so far have not seen any reason to make me change my recommendation as LastPass is one of the better password managers. Nowadays, I push people toward Bitwarden more than I do LastPass. For me, it's almost a toss-up, honestly, between LastPass and Bitwarden. Bitwarden has some really good properties, too. I've been using LastPass a long time, and I don't see any reason not to keep using it. So it's kind of the one I still kind of go to. It's the one I know the best. So I tend to recommend it more. But Bitwarden is also very good. It's open source. It's cheaper. It has all the same main features. If you haven't picked a password manager yet, uh, you know, maybe pick Bitwarden. One password is also good. But LastPass, as near as I can tell, has, has done a fine job here as well. These things are going to happen. They're a big target. It's not surprising that someone's going to try to get in there. And apparently someone did succeed. Now it remains to be seen what kind of information was actually taken. Uh, and my guess is that if your information was affected, that LastPass will be sending you an email. So be on the lookout for that and then take whatever you know, remedial action that they recommend. All right, last up, and this is going to lead into my Dear Carrie question for this week. And this is from Mac Rumors. Anchor's popular Eufy brand security cameras, and that's spelled E-U-F-Y, appear to be sending some data to the cloud even when cloud storage is disabled and local-only storage settings are turned on. The information comes from security consultant Paul Moore, who last week published a video outlining the issue. According to Moore, he purchased a Eufy Doorbell Dual, which was meant to be a device that stored video recording on the device. He found that Eufy is uploading thumbnail images of faces and more information to its cloud service when cloud functionality is not enabled. Moore demonstrates the unauthorized cloud uploading by allowing his camera to capture his image and turning off the Eufy home base. Eufy home base is a, another device that Eufy makes that works with some of their devices uh, so that you can control their devices in your home. It's, it's a control hub. The website is still able to access the content through cloud integration, though he had not signed up for cloud service, and it remains accessible even when the footage is removed from the Eufy app. It's important to note that Eufy does not appear to be automatically uploading full streaming video to the cloud, but rather taking captures of the video as thumbnails. The thumbnails are used in the Eufy app to activate streaming video from the Eufy base station, allowing Eufy users to watch their videos when away from home, as well as for sending rich notifications. In other words, pop up with a picture. The problem is the thumbnails are uploaded to the cloud automatically, even when the cloud functionality is not active. And Eufy also seems to be using facial recognition on the uploads. Some users have taken issue with the unauthorized cloud uploads because Eufy advertises local only service and has been popular among those who want a more private camera solution, which is why I have recommended them. The Eufy website reads, quote, no clouds or costs, unquote. Moore suggests that Eufy is also able to link facial recognition data collected from two separate cameras and two separate apps to users, all without camera owners being aware. Moore tested the Eufy doorbell camera, but this also appears to be how other Eufy cameras function. As Moore demonstrates, the images can be accessed with simple URLs after logging in, which is a potential security risk for those concerned. Eufy did remove the background call that reveals the stored images after Moore's tweet, but did not remove the footage. Mora received a response from Eufy in which Eufy confirmed that it is uploading event lists and thumbnails to AWS, which is Amazon Web Services, but said the data is not able to, quote, leak to the public, unquote, because the URL is restricted, time limited, and requires account login. There is also another issue that Mora has highlighted, suggesting Eufy camera streams can be watched live using an app like VLC, but little information on the exploit is available at this time. Moore said that unencrypted Eufy camera content can be accessed without authentication, which is alarming for Eufy users. And then there's uh, an update where Anchor responded to this article. And so this is, this is Eufy's response. Eufy security is designed as a local home security system. All video footage is stored locally and encrypted on the user's device. With regard to Eufy's security facial recognition technology, this is all processed and stored locally on the user's device. To provide users with push notifications to their mobile devices, some of our security solutions create small preview images or thumbnails of videos that are briefly and securely hosted on an AWS-based cloud server. These thumbnails utilize server-side encryption and are set to automatically delete. Users can only access or share these thumbnails after securely logging into the Eufy security account. 
Although our Eufy security app allows users to choose between text-based or thumbnail-based push notifications, it was not made clear that choosing thumbnail-based notifications would require preview images to be briefly hosted in the cloud. That lack of communication was an oversight on our part, and we sincerely apologize for our error. This is how we plan to improve our communications in this matter. One, we are revising the push notifications option language in the Eufy security app to clearly detail that push notifications with thumbnails require preview images that will be temporarily stored in the cloud. Two, we will be more clear about the use of cloud for push notifications in our consumer-facing marketing materials. Eufy Security is committed to the privacy and protection of our users' data and appreciates the security research community reaching out to us to bring this to our attention. So this leads into my Dear Carrie question. And honestly, it wasn't really originally phrased that way. A listener reached out and sent me an email and actually said this isn't much of a question, but you know, had a concern that this person had raised with me. And, and eventually this turned to an email thread where we talked about this article when it came out as well. And so the gist of this is, can you trust Eufy cameras? This listener had the technical wherewithal to monitor the network traffic coming from a Eufy doorbell camera that they had installed and noticed that this camera was attempting to reach several IP addresses. Oddly, a lot of these IP addresses actually weren't resolvable, like unroutable. That seemed weird. But noticing this, you know, this internet traffic that was not expected obviously raised some uh, concerns. And so this listener reached out to me uh, using the Dear Carrie email address that I've been giving out. So I kind of wanted to acknowledge it as such and, and give you my take on this, such as it is. So obviously this is troubling. This is for a couple of reasons. Uh, first of all, it's an obvious failure of communication on Yuffie's part. They said that your info was only going to be local, and it wasn't. That is certainly problematic. And it's yet another example of this trade-off between convenience and security. They want to show you rich notifications, meaning, you know, I get this, I've got a Eufy doorbell camera. So when there's somebody at my door and they recognize that a human is at my door, I get this little pop-up on my Apple Watch and on my phone that includes a picture, a thumbnail of what the camera saw and why it thinks there is a human at my door. By the way, sometimes it's wrong, but that is convenient. That lets me see what's going on. What was not clear and what Eufy did not make clear is that in order to provide that rich push notification service, it has to take some thumbnails from the video it's capturing and upload it to this Amazon cloud server, which by the way, Amazon does this for everybody. Amazon is one of the most common, uh, more used uh, cloud computing and storage facilities on the planet. So it's, it's not an Amazon thing. It's just a generic service that they offer uh, that Eufy happens to be using. So in order to provide that, you know, pop-up that includes a, a picture, they needed to do this. What Yuffie didn't do was explain clearly that if you want these pop-up notifications that include a little screen capture of what it saw, that means that that little image is going to leave your house and it's going to be stored temporarily and then deleted uh, on a cloud server somewhere, which is counter to what its marketing materials say is going to happen. Now, this article also kind of makes reference to being able to access some of this data without logging in, that seems to be a bug. Uh, the article doesn't really address that, neither did Yuffie in their response. So, you know, we need to hear more about that. And if, if that is the case, then that needs to be disclosed and fixed ASAP. Now, there's another weird twist to this whole story, and that is that some, not all, of Yuffie's camera devices interoperate with Apple's HomeKit Secure Video System, or HKSV for short. Apple's HomeKit is a home automation technology uh, that it has standardized and it is trying to get various IoT vendors to adopt. And Eufy has done this for some, but not all of its products. And when you, instead of hooking up your Eufy camera, uh, and I've got a couple of these as well, instead of hooking it up to the Eufy security app, you can hook it up to Apple's HomeKit instead. And then Apple basically takes over. And Apple is then in the one you are entrusting with this video. And supposedly Apple's HKSV, the secure video system, like Eufy, keeps you in control of all of this video. 
Now, this article did not talk about whether or not that comes into play here at all. Like if you, I would think if that you're using Apple's home kit here to control these devices instead of the security home base or its applications, then, you know, that would mean that everything would be coming from Apple and Eufy would not even be involved, but it's not clear. So we, we don't really know, but just FYI, that is an option for some of these Eufy cameras if you're interested. So just to wrap up, uh, you know, this is disturbing. I think it's mostly an oversight on Eufy's part that they appear they're going to fix, mostly by better communication. You do have the option not to allow these thumbnails to be put in the cloud. For me, as a doorbell camera, I don't think about it too much. It's focused outside my house. You know, sure, I come in through my front door every once in a while too, but it's good to be aware that this is going on so that I can make that choice and decide for myself what I'm comfortable with and what I'm not comfortable with. All right, so there's your news and your Dear Carrie question for the week. By the way, uh, send me your questions. I would love to read them on the air and address them as best I can. You can send those to Dear Carrie at firewallsdon'tstopdragons.com. Uh, and if you go to fdsd.me slash Q&A, as in questions and answers Q&A, it will give you all the details you need for submitting those questions. And by the way, this, this listener just won a free copy of my book. I reached in the grab bag of all the people who had submitted questions. And it also turned out that this person was the one that won uh, the book this month. So there are incentives for submitting your questions. Now, uh, my tip of the week this week is uh, with the holiday season upon us, basically, it is also a time for scammers. This is the time of year when scammers are very, very active. People are spending a lot of money. They're doing a lot of purchasing from stores they wouldn't normally buy from. Uh, they're giving money to charities around this time of year. So it's just it's just a prime time uh, for scams, unfortunately. So as usual, I've already written an article about this and I've sent this to my newsletter subscribers. Uh, you've already gotten a lot of this information, but for my tip of the week, I want to get this to my listeners here as well. And so first of all, phishing is a big one. So let, let's talk about some basic phishing protections that you need to be thinking about. Obviously, one of the first things is, you know, if you read something that's either too good or, or too bad to be true, it probably is. You know, anything that gets you really worked up, anything that makes you anxious or angry or even really happy. I mean, you know, maybe you won some amazing prize, right? I mean, that should immediately trigger a red flag that you know, this could be wrong. Any email or text message you get that has really bad grammar or a lot of spelling mistakes should be a, a tip off that something's not right. Companies that really do know you and have business with you, like your bank or Amazon or Apple, uh, they know your name and they should use that name in any communication so that you can know that they do know who you are. And you know, your email address is obviously not sufficient. I've gotten many spam and scam emails and it's like, Hey, CBP two, you got a problem with your account instead of, you know, Hey, Carrie Parker, you know, that, that, that should tip you off right there that, that it's a scam. Beware of fake emails and text messages you know, around this time of year with package tracking links. That's another common thing. We, we all order tons of tons of stuff this time of year online. And so we, you know, have tracking for those things. And so getting a pop-up message saying, you know, Hey, your package has been delayed. Click here for the latest updates. That'd be very tempting to click on. And you probably do have multiple packages, you know, in the next few weeks being delivered. So you might you know, just think, oh, that's just one of the things I ordered. Let's see what's going on. Be very, very careful. Also, you might get an email that says, oh, Harry, here's the here's your receipt for that five thousand dollar thing you just ordered. Everything's good. We'll deliver it soon. You know, hey, but if you have any problems with this or if or if you didn't really order this, or if you want to cancel your order, click here or, or attached is the invoice, you know, open up the invoice to get more information. You know, those links are probably taking you to phishing sites or malware sites. And those attachments are quite likely infected with viruses and such. So be very careful. You know, as always, you know, don't click on links or open any attachments that you didn't ask for or explicitly expect to receive, even if it's from somebody, you know, the sending information for messages uh, can be fake and your friends accounts may be hacked. It may actually be coming from them, but it still could be bad. Beware of any message or phone call claiming that, you know, you owe money or you broke the law or, you know, you have an account problem or we've detected a computer problem. If you get cold calls or messages out of nowhere claiming these sorts of things, be very, very suspicious. And note that this is another great reason for using a password manager because password managers will not be fooled by phishing sites. Lookalike and fake websites, uh, when you go to them and you say, hmm, why is my password manager not offering to fill in my credentials here? It's probably because you're not on the site you think you are. 
All right, so there's some anti-phishing tips, but uh, also around the holidays, here's some other great tips to keep in mind. First of all, whenever possible, use credit cards, not debit cards. If there's fraud on a debit card, then that money is gone. It's out of your account. You have to somehow convince your bank to give it back to you. Credit cards, you're not out anything until you pay the bill, and you've got plenty of time to find the scams and, and, and report them and be off the hook. Gift cards can be really dangerous. Make sure to only buy gift cards from reputable stores. And before you leave the store, I would open up the card to make sure that it has not already been used. Like usually there's a little peel off thing on the back. Make sure that someone hasn't somehow peeled that off and already used that card and put it back. And just make sure that the card is really in there and it looks valid. During this time of year, keep a really close eye on your bank account and credit card transactions. You know, if you see something fishy, report it immediately. If you haven't already done so, I would put no, you know, notifications on your accounts. Most banks and credit cards allow this now. You can have it notify you if there's any weird, you know, large transactions or foreign transactions or other kind of unusual account activity. Set those up and and, and help to help you keep an automated eye on your on your stuff. Uh, don't broadcast your travel plans ever, but you know, during the holidays, it's not a great time to be advertising that hey, my house is going to be empty for two weeks because we're going to be in the Bahamas. And also, by the way, don't do that to other people, you know, on your social media account, say, Hey, hope you enjoy your two week trip to the Bahamas next week. You should also be aware of any time you get a pop-up or, or someone tells you that, Hey, you know, you need to install this app or you know, on your phone or a computer for me to help you, or, you know, you need to update your driver or you need this plugin for your browser, you know, anything prompting you to install something that you weren't expecting is suspicious. Uh, no reputable service or company will ever ask you for your password, you know, via text or phone call. Whenever you have an actual problem with a government account, you know, the IRS or Social Security or whatever, or even local government stuff as well, they will send you something to your address on record in physical mail via snail mail. You are not going to be called by those people uh, saying you've got a problem and expect you to do something right then and there on the phone to fix it. Watch out for phony charities around this time of year, especially the really pushy ones. If you actually answered this phone call uh, and they're being really, really pushy and don't want to let you go, just forget it. Just hang up. Finally, if you haven't already done so, this is a great time to freeze your credit. If you're not somebody who is constantly getting new credit cards or opening loans or things like that and don't often need you know, access to your credit, this is a good thing to do. Freeze your credit at all the major bureaus. And then finally, turn on two-factor authentication everywhere you can. And finally, if you are a victim, you should report it. If you go to my article on this, I've got some links for how to report this in the United States, but uh, your country may have its own things, but you should definitely let them know so they can be aware these things are happening and, you know, and maybe do something about it. All right. So that's a bummer to think about, but you know, during the holidays, we got to be safe. So, so there you have it, everybody. There's your news, your dear Carrie question and your tip of the week. All right, everybody, it's a long one. Thanks for hanging in there. Again, this will be your last official news episode for 2022. I've got a great interview next week with Josh Corman. Then we've got our best of 2022 episode, which I will actually include a few snippets from uh, my patron only podcast stuff, my patron only bonus content, just to give you a little taste of what's going on there. So that will be good. Even if you've been a loyal listener all year, there will still be some new stuff in the best of 2022 episode. And then I've got a great interview with the CEO of Safing about VPNs and and reverse firewalls and some things like that. So that'll come up after that. And then uh, we'll be in a new year after that. And we'll talk about new year's resolutions and winners of the contest and things like that. So uh, for the contest, go to fdsd.me slash EP 300. You can get all the information there again, almost $2,000 worth of stuff I'm giving away. Uh, you've got until the end of the year to do that. And I've also got a great patron promotion going on right now for new and existing patrons. All you got to do is sign up for an annual membership. Go to fdsd.me slash coin promo, and you'll get all the information and details there. Send me your questions. I would love to answer them on the air, uh, at least as best I can. Uh, and you can do that by going to fdsd.me slash Q&A. And note that the fifth edition of the book is now pre-orderable on Amazon. And you can find that by going to, wait for it, fdsd.me slash book. Now, a couple things to note real quick. The price that's listed now is too high. I don't know where they got that price. That is not going to be the final price of the book. The description is also a little bit off. Uh, there's some edits that need to be done to that. And the release date is wrong. It will actually be much sooner than February 7th, which is what it currently says. But it is there and it is pre-orderable. You can see the cover. And I'm hoping, I am really hoping that it is actually going to be shippable before Christmas. 
But, you know, hey, if you really want to give this for a gift for Christmas, you can always just take a picture of the cover and just wrap up the cover in a box and then give them the actual book later. Also, if you're still looking for gifts, check out my best and worst gift guide. And of course, there are some great free downloadable coupons there if you want to help some of your friends and family to increase their security and privacy. All of that can be found on my website. All right, everybody. Thanks for tuning in. Have a very happy holidays. So until next week and throughout this month, especially stay safe out there and don't get caught with your drawbridge down.